Joining us on the Heaster Automotive Group hotline is Panthers Playbook host and producer of The Drive every afternoon, Dennis Cox, who is in Charlotte today. It also happens to be opening day for Panthers training camp as well. And Dennis, before I, before you and I chop it up a little bit, I want to set us up by listening to this Jadavion Clowney from yesterday. You know, he's All bounced right. around a bit, certainly a veteran and whatnot, and he talked about winning culture. I, like I just tell him every day, um, don't come in here with no bad attitude. You, it's something you signed up for a long time ago, like I had to learn. So when you show up, keep that. Don't bring nobody else down. That's what it takes. You come here with your attitude straight. You here for a short short amount of time, short period, two hours of practice. Just don't bring nobody else down while you out there working because that's big for everybody else doing them two hours to get their work in. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's so important, man, uh, everybody be on the same page and um, the energy to be where it's supposed to be for us to succeed in the league. That's what I think it come down to everybody buying in and the energy that they bring every day. Dennis, that's different from last year. Right, clearly winning culture, but different vibe. You have a veteran presence, though, with Jadavion Clowney, and if Bryce Young isn't saying it, I would hope that it would be someone like him. I 100% agree, and I think this is something that if you're a Panthers fan, you got to be excited about with the Dave Canales era because with Frank Reich, it was coming in like, all right, this guy just knows a bunch of X's and O's, and it's just there was no actual culture established with the team. It feels like for the first time since – if you even go back to Ron Rivera, outside of like that short bit where Steve Wilkes was the interim head coach, that this team actually wants to have an identity of some sort. And that culture is so vital for it. And I think this is where Dave Canales comes in. And Dave Canales and Dan Morgan both understand that this is going to be a multi-year process, but you have to start it right now. And having a guy like Clowney saying something like that, it's like, look, you signed up to be here. You chose to do this profession. You chose to sign with this team. Show up and work can't be mad about your situation when you chose to be part of it. Dennis Cox, host of Panthers Playbook and producer of The Drive with Tim Donnelly, which you can listen to every afternoon right here on The Fan. Join us on Next Up. Dennis, sticking with defense for just a little bit, I want to talk about the defensive line depth. When you look at Derek Brown, Shai Tuttle, Ashawn Robinson, that's a stout defensive front. But what do the Panthers have to do to beef up the second and third group? That's a little weak right now. Well, I would say that there's probably lack of depth really across the whole team. And that's kind of part of the rebuild is that you might have some good front line in terms of those first team guys. But after that, things kind of fall off a little bit. Some guys like Bravion Roy that got some starting reps last year. And then Ashawn Robinson now gets signed as a defensive lineman. Now he's a backup. Bravion Roy is like those kinds of guys got a ton of valuable reps last year. So that kind of adds to your depth on the interior. Also, you got drafted a guy like, um, like Crumity in the sixth round from Mississippi State. Maybe he's a depth player that doesn't have to come in and play right away because you signed Robinson, because you have Derek Brown, because you have Shai Tuttle. So those guys you can kind of develop a little bit. The way Ejero Evero on defense is constantly substituting players in and out, a lot of guys are going to get reps. And oftentimes we see in the NFL, you're going to five defensive backs, six defensive backs. So you're taking defensive linemen off the field which will allow, hopefully, guys to stay fresh throughout the game. So on the interior of the defensive line, I think that's you, you have three strong ones, like you said, Graham, with Robinson, Brown, and Tuttle. Roy's going to provide a little bit of depth. Uh, the big question, actually, in terms of depth-wise, is actually on the edge. Because outside of Clowney, you have guys like D.J. Wanham's injured. You have guys like uh, D.J. Johnson uh, in his second year got hurt in minicamp. Uh, Mari Barno still recovering from an injury. Caleb on chase on has been in the league for four years, but only has five total sacks. Like there's major questions on the edge when it comes to that defensive front. Dennis Cox, host of Panthers playbook podcast available 99, nine, the fan YouTube page, as well as wherever you find your favorite podcast. Just make sure you like, and subscribe to Panthers playbook. Dennis as this team gets together. This team starts figuring things out. I've noticed recently, and we chopped it up a little bit earlier on in this program about this, that the Panthers were getting dunked on quite a bit, that they were getting grouped into, and rightfully so just based on history, getting grouped into those teams that were basically predicted to spin their wheels so much to where the Vegas Lions have them at five and a half. The expectations continue to be low. How can the Panthers erase that stigma even before they start playing actual snaps under first-year coach Dave Canales? I, I think, honestly, I don't know if you can. I don't think that they can because it's one of those situations where you have to prove it on the field in games that matter. Like, yeah, you can go out there in the preseason, you know, 
on, on August 8th up in uh, Gillette Stadium when you played the New England Patriots and go, hey, we won this game, you know, 24-10 or whatever. Cool, great. Are you going to do that in the regular season? I don't think they really can change that perception until they actually step on the field in September and actually win games. And then, or at least be competitive in games. Be like, hey, you know what? The Panthers didn't win, but they're a tough out. Like, they're well coached. Um, their offense is way better than it improved than it was last season. The defense is able to get stops when, when necessary. And you're competitive in consistently game in and game out. Unless that happens, that perception's not going to change. Dennis, one thing I wanted to ask you early in the program, we played a soundbite from general manager Dan Morgan where he talked about really not setting expectations ahead of the season. And I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he said that right now playoffs is something that they're not thinking about. And I think that's fair to say, right, when it's just with this much change going into this organization, you got to take this season one week at a time. Um, I think that is the right approach, and I think this is um, Dan Morgan kind of protecting guys a little bit. I would say in the sense of if you just walk up there and say like, yeah, playoffs and then you, and you go, you know, the Vegas line five and a half wins, you know, somewhere in that range and to be like, well, you said playoffs, you stunk last year. And then you were, weren't that great this year. I think he's setting the expectation for the team to be like, you know what, this is a, this is a process that's going to take a couple of years for, to turn things around. I think this year is about changing the culture of the team getting some of those core guys or establishing some of those core guys and then building off of that into 2025 and beyond. Dennis, before we run with you, is it possible for us to stop talking about Stephon Gilmore? Oh, yeah, it's easy. He's not on the team. It's super easy. He's not on the team. I know a lot of people want him to come back, but guess what? Stephon Gilmore, from my understanding, was asking for a pretty good amount of money, um, you know, somewhere even close to like 10 million bucks. And he has the option of waiting and seeing there's probably a team out there that's going to realize that training camp that's getting underway this week for pretty much everyone in the NFL is going to go, hey, you know what? We do need an elite corner. That's someone that can step in and play right away. Oh, let's go sign Stephon Gilmore. And he can sit there and say, like, yeah, you know what? I don't think you're going to be a good team. I don't need to sign with you right now. So, yeah, it's easy to stop talking about Stephon Gilmore. He's not there. <laughs> Dennis Cox live in Charlotte for us uh, for ACC kickoff and certainly with his hands on uh, – Panthers camp as well. Wait, wait, Paul, I have one more question for All Dennis. Right. Uh, I know Big Ten Media Day is taking place right now up in hmm. Indiana, but are we expecting to see an appearance from Fake Matt Rule at Panthers training camp this week when we're in Charlotte? Uh, fake Matt Rule might make an appearance on Monday at Panthers training camp. That might be, uh, that might be the time that we see uh, Fake Matt Rule uh, reestablish himself as the, uh, the sideline boss for the Carolina Panthers. At the end of the day, it all just comes down to timing, right? It does. Dennis, appreciate you, man. We'll uh, catch you uh, 3 to 6 this afternoon from Charlotte. Thanks, guys. All right. Uh, Dennis Cox on the Heaster Automotive Group hotline. Uh, digging into the Panthers as they move forward here again today is the first day of actual practice. Veterans reported yesterday. Rookies have been around for a while. Bryce Young did speak quite a bit. We didn't even talk about Bryce so much uh, talking with Dennis there. But Bryce, talking about season number two and the pressure that he may or may not feel going into that second season. Bryce Young just thinking, I'm on a mission, right? A normal day, but ready to move forward in terms of getting things rolling with this team and making sure that he knows who his guys are and staying locked in every day. That is the team moving forward. It is his team. It is year number two. And there is some preseason analysis. And again, this is where it's so easy to dunk on this team based on last year's performance and how things went. But I absolutely disagree with some of the takes that are out there and some of the thoughts that are out there that Bryce Young, if he doesn't perform in year two, that they need to go shopping in 2025 for another quarterback. What are you expecting in terms of development with a guy like this? It's not going to be Justin Herbert, who got thrown into a unique situation, is now working on his fourth offensive coordinator in four seasons. We've seen quarterbacks thrive, and we've seen them fail over and over and over again. Perhaps now we have somebody that's actually dialed into him, that has the personnel that works with him. Again, this is about patience. I get it. We are in a win now. Give it to me now. I can't wait for this to happen. Full Karen when it comes to making sure that we see progress, making sure that things 
happen immediately. But good things do eventually come to those who wait. And I know, Panthers fans, you've been waiting (laughs) and waiting and waiting for something good to happen. But it's so quick to give up on a player who has had one full season in the NFL, who had to deal with two head coaches and a completely different system, as now being put in another different system. Temper your expectations in that area. Don't, though, go and be satisfied with three-win seasons and four-win seasons and whatnot. Still demand more from the team that you root for. But understand that by giving up on guys that you haven't even tried to develop, this team hasn't even given second thoughts to until right now, that maybe we shouldn't be so quick in that rush to judgment, which is why I despise those. Anytime somebody writes it, anytime somebody says it, after two years you're going to give up on a quarterback that you selected number one. You are not looking at Achilles Smith. You are not looking at Jamarcus Russell. You are looking at Bryce Young, who did everything possible to put him in this situation and still has to avoid comparisons to other quarterbacks in this lead because of where he played and how his team finished. C.J. Stroud was magical in Houston. We all understand that. Anthony Richardson, though, got hurt and has a history of getting hurt and is now back for season two with the Indianapolis Colts. But nobody is calling for Anthony Richardson to be supplanted as a starting quarterback next season. Somehow he gets the free pass and Bryce Young does not. That is a complete double standard. It is inexcusable, and it's stupid to think that way. All right, coming up next, why we should be getting tired. And our double standard is definitely showing when it comes to the NFLers making money. Next up on 99.9 The Fan. I'm Graham Hill with three things you need to know right now from 99.9 The Fan. The Durham Bulls continue their series tonight against the Gwinnett Stripers at Durham Bulls Athletic Park. You can hear play-by-play coverage on 99.9 HD2, 6.20 AM Bus Sports Radio, 99.3 and 96.5 FM, WRL News Plus. Pre-game coverage begins at 6.21. The first pitch is at 6.35. Duke is bringing a pair of quarterbacks and a trio of veterans to Charlotte to represent them at ACC football kickoff today. Along with hearing from head coach Manny Diaz, you'll also hear from quarterbacks Grayson Loftus, Malik Murphy, and wide receiver Jordan Moore, offensive lineman Justin Pickett, and safety Jalen Stinson. Our local sports coverage continues at noon today with the Adam Gold Show, followed by the drive with Tim Donnelly and Dennis Cox. Both shows are live from ACC kickoff in Charlotte. You can stream both shows as well on 999 The Fans' YouTube channel and never miss a play. And you can find these stories and more on WRLSportsFan.com. We are at ACC football kickoff today and tomorrow with Adam Gold and The Drive. They will be live in Charlotte with insight and interviews thanks to Wilkinson Chevrolet Cadillac Buick GMC in Sanford. You can catch all the interviews on our YouTube channel from Tuesday. The guys were there on Tuesday. Yeah, we're there. Like, you want us to be there? We are there covering college football for you. Not just the two days the local teams are there but all the teams. The ACC expanded by three. We wanted to make sure that we were there to cover that expansion. You only get so many historic days, Graham. Like Creed says, we welcome Cal and Stanford to the ACC with arms wide open. <laughs> Can we you did take that. me higher? Are you going to that show, by the way, in, what, <laughs> in, uh, in September? Cre- I'm not. Oh. I'm not. I'll be there. Will you? Yeah. Will you be shouting at the top of your lung? So if there's anybody at the Creed concert that knows me, well, they might not know yeah. me because we're not on television. Just look they know the, me from the drive. Just, just come up and say hello. Just look for the guy who's singing, like, the Pina Colada song or something by <laughs> Dan Hill. Or, the music in between. Right? <laughs> there's an intermission. There'll be some dude singing along. That's Graham. That's Graham. You'll find Graham. Paul Eihander with you on this Wednesday morning. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Our double standard is showing. I'm tired of talking about NFL players' salaries at this point, and here's why. Back in the day, when an NFL player would sign an extraordinary contact or contract or any sports figure by any means, especially when it came to the NBA, you were like, oh my goodness, how much was that? Oh, $100 million. And we would talk about that for like three or four days going, are they worth the money? Is it worth the money? Is it worth the money? And then now we see the current modern-day NFL 
where guys like Trevor Lawrence are getting guaranteed cash, $150 million, $137 million for Jared Goff. Pat Mahomes is making $500 million. The days of extraordinary numbers are kind of gone, right? And I'm not sure a lot of folks can relate to the kind of money that gets splashed around there because it's really not out of their reach. And I heard a conversation about life-changing money, right? And life-changing money means different things to different people. And it all depends on goals. Like the current goal right now for every retired athlete, apparently, is to own a soccer club. Like, I want to own a soccer club in Europe. I thought it was supposed to, I thought it was supposed to go into uh, sports media. There's that. But those with the means, right? They're all buying these soccer clubs, and that's half the half the bit right now. I'm buying an I'm buying partial interest in an English third league team, or whatever that means. I don't know what that means, you know. But that that's the current bit. But people talk about life changing money, and that is different for a lot of folks. Like you never hear about that in the NHL, right? This is life changing money. He signed for eight million dollars. Well, and then you go to the NBA where LeBron James signed for two seasons for fifty two million dollars a year. $52 million. It's unfathomable. But then we call out the guys who want to make more money, and this is where I struggle with the idea of asking for more, asking for more salary. We are C.D. Lamb is going to sit out, right? Currently under contract for the Dallas Cowboys. He's going to sit out. He's not going to do anything. Tua goes to Miami Dolphins camp. The question mark, is he going to do anything? He is under contract. It's the same way this Hassan Reddick situation, New York Jets, holding out. But he's under contract. It was well known he wanted more money, but he's under contract. Brandon Ayuk went full public, burn the house down mode to ask for more money in a contract year. He's got one more year. And Brandon Ayuk showed up in San Francisco and is in full attendance. He is there, not skipping out on anything. He is there with his teammates. But Brandon Ayuk gets skewered because he went public with his money request. Jordan Love in Green Bay, who's going to get paid a quarter billion dollars as the starting quarterback for the Green Bay Packers, also showed up to camp. But the expectation is we're all friends here. Yep, we know what he was getting into. He's here. He's showing support. The guys are all showing support. So what makes that different from Brandon Ayuk? Right now, now you could went out there and said, oh, I want to trade. Force me a trade. Sign me. Big deal. Whatever it is. Jordan Love just showing up. But I'm not going to practice. I want a new contract. I'm holding out. I don't want to get tweaked. Get something done for me. What is the difference? Like the money is so astronomical that it's not even about money anymore. It feels more about respect. And I think maybe that's where that conversation has to change because no one's ever surprised by the dollar amounts, the 250, the 125 guaranteed, and I'm talking millions, right? The life-changing money. It's well beyond that at this point. Like, I could throw a million numbers at you. It won't make any sense because you just won't care anymore because you're numb to it, and I'm getting numb to it. It's about respect, but we are flexing our double standard by creating issues that aren't there where one player goes public and the other does not, but they still show up and they show out for their teammates. 